Hi there, and welcome to part two of the 1920s Most Excellent Review. We're going to go right back into our slideshow. So when I left you, we were talking about the economics of the 1920s. I had just gone over the inequality. Now we're going to talk about the fact that 25,000 workers died in this decade. Over 100,000 workers were permanently injured. So the rights of the working class did not seem to have made great improvements even after the uh, successes of the progressive era. Um, this maldistribution of wealth, as one historian called it, was very dramatic. A University of Wisconsin-Madison uh, professor was famous for having noted that it was in fact only the upper 10% of the population that enjoyed this marked increase in real income. Another uh, fellow at the time, a politician, Congressman Fiorello La Guardia, you may have heard his name, they named the airport in, after him, uh, or an airport after him, um, has this famous line where he said, I confess I was not prepared for what I actually saw. It seemed almost incredible that such conditions of poverty could really exist. Here's a congressman going out to explore his own congressional district and saying how shocked he was to find out how poor people really were. And here's the reality. Historians and people remembering the 20s, they're not lying when they talk about this prosperity and the excitement and the fun. The reality is, is that's what people talked about in the 1920s. Somebody like LaGuardia, a congressman, had to go out and walk around to see this poverty because we had this issue of what we could call the silent suffering, right? The poor and the downtrodden were more or less silent. They weren't publishing the newspapers. They weren't putting out the media that we often look to to look at the history of the time period. Why did we not have as many protests or complaints or outspoken voices in the 1920s? Well, one really big obvious reason, of course there's three of them, the first one being this fear of radicalism. If you spoke out, if you complained about the way things were, you were labeled a rat, a communist, and you could be shipped out of the country. There was enormous tension, right? And number two was the fear of foreigners. A large majority of the people who were living in the urban slums were recently arrived immigrants. And immigrants were getting a really hard time. So what did you do? You held your head down, you kept quiet, and you just went about your life. And then, of course, number three, there is what we call the deliberate strategy theory. This one is, you know, you can take it however you want, but it's this idea that um, it was a strategy of both the political parties as well as the uh, major media to really not tell their side of the story, to really leave that out of the picture, that politics and entertainment and media was focusing on the other side and they were doing just fine because there was so much money in this booming class of, of, the, of the wealthy upper classes. Um, speaking of this, we can talk about the tax policies of the 20s. This was a period of cutting taxes, especially dramatic in terms of cutting taxes to those in the upper class. Let's start with this little quote. Taxation should not be used as a field for socialistic experiment or as a club to punish success. Now keep in mind, the income tax is a brand new thing that just came up during the progressive era and towards the end of World War I. And almost immediately after creating this progressive income tax, meaning the more you made, the more tax you paid, we're going to see it disappearing. That was Andrew Mellon. And he's the Secretary of the Treasury. Uh, under President Harding. He said that in 1923. Uh, here's another one. Taxing power should not be used to regulate the economy or to bring about social change. It sounds a lot like Mellon and his tax philosophy and Harding and his tax philosophy. And we'll see though, in fact, it's Ronald Reagan, 1980. And there's going to be later comparisons to the 1980s between the 80s and the 20s and maybe the 90s, but we'll get into that obviously later. Keep it in mind though. Uh, let's look at the Revenue Act of 1924, also called the Mellon Tax Plan, right? Because this is Andrew Mellon and his tax plan. Basically, the upper tax bracket, if you're paying the most, uh, the million millionaires and above, well, probably a little bit lower than that and above, we're getting a 50% income tax. And that's going to cut in half to 25%. You're going to go from 50% to 25%. The lower tax bracket, on the other hand, is going to go from 4% to 3%. All right. Now, they're paying a lot less in taxes, but of course, they're making a lot less and they can afford a lot less. But let's just keep that in mind. So what's going to happen when you cut the upper tax bracket in half? The argument, of course, was that you don't want to punish the success of the wealthy and that they're going to reinvest this wealth and they're going to spread this wealth around. This is an old argument and it's been around for a very long time. It goes almost all the way back to Alexander Hamilton. Um, 
But what was the reality? What happened to a lot of that extra wealth that was created? Well, there's a lot of arguments, a lot of different ways of looking at this. Uh, but one thought is that a lot of it went into stock market speculation. How else do we explain the highest rate of speculation and the fastest growth of the stock market that we've ever seen? We, it leads us to a bubble, which unfortunately is also going to lead us to a massive collapse. But again, we'll get into that later. This is the main thing that you need to know for now. The 1920s is also a new era of strikes. Even though I said people were a little bit quieter in the 20s, it's not over. It's far from over. The labor movement is has been hurt significantly, but they're not done. And some of the most dramatic strikes uh, in American history will happen in this time period. The first one, of course, being the 1919 Seattle General Strike. A general strike, good term to know, this is when everybody goes on strike. Every industry, every union across the board, teachers, hospitals, farm workers, factory workers, uh, textile workers, the city was literally shut down, right? And this was an intense time. All the unions, all of Seattle, uh, silk mill workers strike, construction strike, uh, everybody going on strike. Um, Here's a little poster that was talking about Russia did it, right? The war profits. Uh, and actually, this one uh, is not propaganda against them. Unfortunately, this is themselves kind of burying themselves. This is the unions talking about how the success of Russia. Of course, nobody in the States, or not nobody, but most people didn't realize how catastrophic the communist revolution was going to be in the long run for Russia. And there was this idea that, look at that, the workers came together and they were successful. Uh, so why don't we do it too? Uh, and of course, this was very uh, um, quick and easy then for the Seattle and the Washington government and the United States government, deputizing whoever they could, bringing in federal troops. They crushed the strike dramatically and quickly, and it's over, uh, and it's a big mess, and a lot of people get deported and arrested, uh, and it is really, truly crushed. Here's an IWW cartoon from this time period, the industrial unionism trying to strike its knife into the heart of capitalism, and a part of capitalism, this octopus it's showing, the poverty and the child labor and the wage slavery and the prostitution in the war. Now the thing is, of course, and it's an Italian uh, thing down below, uh, it says, um, what does it say? I can't remember what the translation was. Um, but anyways, um, the idea is those were all real problems, right? The child labor, the poverty, and so on and so forth. Uh, and so when the IWW had this appeal to fighting a, a, against capitalism, there were a lot who, who would listen, who would go in for this. It made a lot of sense. Uh, but on the flip side, uh, these strikes are not very successful in this time period. I mentioned the Pennsylvania steel mill strike. That one ended with a lot of deportations. A lot of the foreign workers were kicked out of the country. They actually would uh, use one ethnic group against another. The Italians and the Serbs was one case. And, and we have actually a historical evidence of that being the published strategy. The textile strike I mentioned in Rhode Island, we won't go into details on that. Um, we had, uh, I should mention real quick before I get into the Supreme Court, that there was tariffs at this time, a rise in tariffs. So again, we see government favoring big business uh, against the necessarily possibly you could argue against the the benefit of the average or common man because prices are higher when the tariffs are higher the Supreme Court gets involved how do they get involved Colorado Coal Company versus United Mine Workers this would be a good one if you're gonna write about strikes and unions and all that business um, they found in this case that a striking union could be held uh, liable for the the or penalized, I should say, or held liable for the cost of the strike, right? They were found guilty of being in restraint of trade in that famous uh, Sherman antitrust, which was supposed to be keeping the monopolies under control and was still being used against the workers. So again, the reforms and successes we saw of the progressive era are being peeled back because obviously if a union is held accountable for all the cost of their strike, all the money not made while they're working, that'll crush them. There's no way that they could run such a thing. Uh, there we have the Sherman Antitrust Act being used against them. Um, we also see the famous Atkins versus Children's Hospital, right? And that one is especially important. I would definitely make sure you make a note card on that one, but both of these are good to know. And this is one that strikes down the minimum wage very dramatically. It takes away the ability to set minimums, and so for people were being paid insanely low amounts of money. 
some might say, well, why didn't they just work somewhere else? Uh, I would argue that there was, the reality was that that was not a possibility in that time. This is not necessarily connected to today's minimum wage debate. This was at the beginning of even just creating one. Um, child labor is also brought back by the courts. They found it unconstitutional to get rid of child labor. And so child labor has its final heyday in this time period. It won't go away until World War II. Um, the Atkins Children's Hospital had to do with due process and Fifth Amendment, if you want the technical, uh, that it was taking away um, people's um, equal right to the law. But we won't, you don't have to worry about those details necessarily. Um, labor union membership will plummet in this time period. The government's against them. The courts are against them. Um, it seems like popular opinion is against them. It's a very difficult time, and there are fewer strikes for sure in this time period. Um, I want to switch gears 160 degrees and talk about uh, Middletown and this famous study of modern American culture that comes out at the end of the decade. And it's a study that happens in the beginning, in the early 1920s. They, this uh, couple, Robert and Helen Lynn, sociologists, uh, will go to a little town called Munchie, Indiana, and they're going to write this famous book, Middletown, A Study in American Culture. They're going to spend 18 months uh, looking at this community and trying to explain kind of how American functions. And so this is just a heyday for historians. This book they could ask you questions about, but also understanding what we learned uh, from this book is really interesting stuff. Um, but I want to point out one of the most important criticisms of this book. Looking back, that was the 1920s. It was a different time. But of course, they brought the racism of the 20s into it. And they didn't speak to a single African-American in the middle town, or I should say Munchie community. And it was a small population, 5%. But 5% of a community is a significant proportion of the community. But that aside, they came up with some pretty dramatic results. And that is their major conclusion was that America was drifting into two distinct classes of people, right? The wealthy and the poor, uh, and yet they shared the same goals, right? Both groups, rich and poor, shared a desire to accumulate, a desire to consume, to purchase, to buy, to have the latest, greatest new stuff. So we have made the full and final transition from the old America where people made stuff, traded for stuff. Uh, it's been gradual, right? We had a lot of change in the 1840s, but now it has truly gone over and it becomes the great era of consumption, right? And we're talking about a lot of things. The new things in the 1920s are going to include things like um, <clears throat> cornflakes and toaster ovens and the car, the automobile. Um, listening to the radio, the radio becomes big, right? And the radio will have a huge impact. Um, it's the era of mass consumption and advertising. I'll get to that in just a second. I want to point out that in this little town of Munchie, now this is the north, the south would have been radically different. 99% of the community had electricity, right? Uh, in this town in 1923, I'm just going to throw a couple of these out there. Uh, you don't need to know these numbers, so don't try to take notes on this. But people bought 1,000 ironing uh, machines so they could iron their clothes. 709 vacuum cleaners were sold. 463 toasters were sold. 371 washing machines. 18 refrigerators. That was still just for the wealthiest of the wealthy. Over 1,000 electric hair curlers, right? Everybody's buying and people want to get this stuff. These new appliances, you need to buy it and you want to buy it. And there's a new way of selling it, right? So let's go to the culture change and let's talk about what it looks like. Mass consumption and advertising. Mass marketing, right? The assembly line has reached its heyday and they're consuming and they're producing like crazy. And advertising catches up with it, right? It's the 1920s advertising era. It's the beginning of a whole new way of persuasion and sexual suggestion and seduction to convince people to buy things. Sears catalogs and the whole sending out of catalogs really reaches a, a high point. The public relations man, the whole growth of an industry really of advertising and getting people to buy and consume and to really change the way people thought about things, right? Um, and you had to get people, you had to teach people to want more and more and more, right? So here's your assembly line and the automobile, and we'll get into that in just a moment because that dramatically changes things, right? Um, just a couple advertisements from the 1920s. Your chocolate, she likes them best. You've got the suggestion, right? It's not just chocolate anymore. It's, it's about a sexual dynamic, right? This is for, the, for women's, women's clothing. Um, 
what else do we have? Coca-Cola, 7 million drinks a day. And her dress doesn't look scandalous today, but you can see her knees. And in the 1920s, ooh boy, I tell you, that was something else, right? Palm Olive. I think this one's kind of a little bit on the creepy side, but it's a 1920s ad. Keep that schoolgirl complexion when she grows up, right? So that the little girl can be just as pretty now, later when she's older. I don't know, something like that. Um, it's also the invention of the whole idea of buying on credit. We have created the concept of being in debt and a whole new generation of people in debt. Buy today, pay later. $10 down today, $12 a month. The installment plan that was known as. And production leaps by two thirds. It's a huge change when people can just put a little bit of money down. You don't have to be rich. You don't have to be wealthy. You can get it right away, right? And it's a lot of excitement and a lot of people buying a lot of stuff, but also getting deeply in debt and paying far more than the original value of the item. Another thing I want to cover in cultural change is this best selling book of the time, The Man Nobody Knows by Bruce Barton. Uh, it says right there on the screen, the classic account of Jesus as business entrepreneur, one of the best-selling books of the 20th century. Uh, it was 1925 that it took number one on the bestseller list, and it's the story, literally, of Jesus Christ as an ad man, and he describes him as being the founder of modern business. He says he took 12 nobodies and he built the best corporation in the world. Uh, and the idea really is making religion accessible to businessmen and also making business religious. In other words, saying that it's okay to be rich and successful and powerful and ruthless in the business field because it's the way um, that Christianity would have wanted us to do things. Uh, let me just add a few other quick cultural changes. Sports becomes a business. It's no longer just a fun activity that people do in their neighborhoods. It's a multi-million dollar game. Baseball, there's Babe Ruth in the upper left corner, right? We talk about the house that Babe built and New York Stadium and his home runs and this million dollar business. Jack Dempsey, the famous boxer, probably never heard of him, I'm guessing most of you listening to this now, but he was called the Manasseh Mahler and he was a huge, famous, successful, came from all over the country and all over the world to see him box. Anybody know where Manasseh is, by the way? It's a small town not far from Alamosa, Colorado. So he's our hometown hero, Jack Dempsey. Um, I'm going to stop there before I talk about cars because we're reaching our 15 minute limit. So please join us for part three a little bit later. Thanks.